Nissan is one of the manufacturers that really launched the EV revolution with the Leaf, but they haven't done any new cars for quite some time until now. This is the Nissan Ariel, one of the most anticipated electric vehicles the last couple of years. We're here at the launch in Stockholm and we're going to take a first look at this fantastic new car. Before we give you the details though, please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel. So you can see it's got a very futuristic look. This is a pure battery electric platform so it doesn't actually have a grill at the front which is a nice thing to see. Uh, it's got LED lights front and back. So since launch, they've actually simplified the models that they're going to deliver of the Aria. There's now only three versions and two trim levels. So you have the uh, 863 kilowatt hour battery and the 87 kilowatt hour battery. And there's a front wheel drive version and an all wheel drive E-Force version. Now E-Force is spelled E hyphen four O-R-C-E. Very trendy, very, very cool. Nice one, Nissan. We'll give you more details of what each of the trims involves in the written review. So have a look in the section below for uh, the link to that written review. I'm now here at the rear of the area. See what I did there? There are two trim versions, the Advance and the Evolve. We have the top of the range Evolve here in 63 kilowatt hour form. So it's a, it's a two wheel drive. We're not gonna be able to give the four wheel drive version uh, a, a run through today. Now this car looks black, but it's actually supposedly green, but it's a bit of a dull day today, so you can't quite see how the color will change to green in the sunlight. So the charge port here is at the front, just press to open it. And what you'll notice if you're a Lissan fan, and maybe if you're a Leaf owner, is that this is not Chadmo. This is a CCS port. So you've got the, uh, this is for your type two cable, and then you put your, your uh, full CCS DC charging cable over the top there. Now this car will charge at up to 130 kilowatts with DC charging, which means that it'll actually get the 80% uh, charge in about 30 minutes uh, with a fast enough rapid charger. Now, another really nice feature that Nissan has added to this car is that they support AC charging up to 22 kilowatts. Now, I don't think it's available on all the models, but that means that you can put a, uh, like 98% like of the charge in this car in a about, I think they said two hours and 35 minutes. So that's almost like rapid charging. So if you happen to have three phase power, maybe a workplace, you're gonna be able to recharge this car very quickly. So this 63 kilowatt hour car has a range of 250 miles, which is decent. But if you go up to the 87 kilowatt hour version of the two wheel drive car, you get 329 miles. It drops down to 310 if you have the E-Force four wheel drive system, but that's still pretty good in the same sort of ballpark as for example, the Tesla Model Y long range. So this car has a kick boot release allegedly, and you can see it did actually work. Some of them are a little bit temperamental. This boot is enormous, 468 liters. And you have these divining panels for a split floor, and you can see you can keep your charging cables underneath there. This is a fairly rudimentary parcel shelf. Take that off. You can see it's got a traditional 40-60 split here. Now, this is a bit tricky. I'm probably have to go around the side to open these, these doors. <coughs> so I have to go around the sides to open the, uh, the seats. So you've got the uh, 60 there. So this is now 1,713 litres. Now, putting that in perspective, that's a similar boot size to the uh, Skoda Enyaq IV, and one of the largest in its class, absolutely enormous. You do lose a couple of litres, apparently, with the right-hand drive version for some reason. Um, I don't know why they seem to be against right-hand drive uh, cars especially since Japan drives in the same side as we do in the UK. Um, also, if you get the dual motor version, you lose some of this boot space because the electric motor is, is uh, at the back as well as the front. But still, absolutely enormous, enormous boot. If you have a large amount of stuff to cart around, this car's gonna be excellent. We really like some of the details here. You just about see on the top of here, there's this, um, this retainer to keep the seat belt in place as you put the uh, seat back. And there's a real sense of quality with that whole mechanism. It's very, very reassuring. Nissan talks about this car having a lounge-like interior feeling. And part of that is because of the this being a pure electric uh, system. You've got the batteries under the floor. 
the, all the, the motors and even the air conditioning cupboards is right up at the front and uh, they've got, it's got a really long wheelbase. Now it's not um, unique, you know, the uh, ID range of cars from Volkswagen have a similar approach, but you definitely get a sense of spaciousness. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the tip of quite a typical steering wheel, the controls are all fairly traditional, but one of the things that they've done is that they've actually made these um, uh, controls for the air conditioning and some of the other controls, touch uh, controls with haptic feedback. There's plenty of room here in the driver's seat. I'm five foot 10 and I think if I was six foot three, I'd still probably be okay. So this central console is pretty minimalist. You've got these two cup holders with these mechanisms here that will help you have different size cups in there. You couldn't put a really large cup in there. You know, the controls for the drivetrain that we'll talk about in a bit. But this is a novel feature with the uh, top trim level. You've got this console. So this console will move forward and backwards 15 centimeters. So that could be really useful if you need to slide across Again, not an entirely unique feature. The, uh, some of the Ionic 5 uh, range have this feature as well, but you know they don't have it powered like this. There's a pretty small glove box, probably only enough for some silk gloves really there. Allegedly, there is another kind of magic box under here, although we haven't quite worked out how to open that just yet. So alongside, you can cover up those cup holders as well. And under here, you have a wireless phone charger, a small space here, but actually there isn't a lot of space in this central cubby. Lot, there's a lot less than a lot of cars in this class. So carrying on with that theme of having a lounge-like experience, this feels really quite spacious. I would say the headroom is maybe not as much as some cars in this class because you have a slightly sloped uh, rear roof line. But I think if, if you're up to, um, six foot or so you'll be fine plenty of knee room um, and these seats are really comfortable as well I should have mentioned that about the front seats really comfortable lovely upholstery <coughs> now if you don't have a middle passenger this middle seat is <coughs> it's probably okay you wouldn't want to be an adult traveling for two or three hours in in this middle seat but a kid will probably be fine if you don't have somebody in this middle seat you can pull this forward you've got a couple of cup holders here nice uh, armrest very typical thing and you can see you've got a USB-C port and USB port here for the rear passengers and actually separate controls for heated rear seats, which is again is another nice feature, not that common. And rear seat passengers also benefit from these magazine holders for your kids to put their copies of Yukai Mishima or whatever it is kids read these days. So a fairly traditional steering wheel, you can see it's got a slightly flat bit at the bottom, it's got a nice feel to it. You've got media controls and menu controls on the left and on the right you've got some controls for the uh, cruise control. This has the, uh, the Pro Drive system from Nissan with a link to the Navi Link which adds things like knowledge of the road um, and traffic and that kind of changes the way uh, the, the uh, cruise control works. So you've got two 12.3 inch LCD panels now this one is a fairly non-traditional version of a, a driver display. You can see you've got the speed at the top, you've got the range on the right, and you've got the, the power and regen on the left and some various information around that. And really central in this uh, particular configuration is the ADAS information, but you can have other things like settings um, on there as well. So this version, this trim level also has a HUD. You can see it's got the speed and speed limit and some sat nav information on there. And when you're driving it, will give you some safety information as well. So this kind of gear selector type affair has a, you push forward for reverse and then you've got um, back for drive and there's a B mode as well. You've got a button here for park. You've got to press this button on the side to uh, select reverse. Now you'll notice that there are these, these buttons here. So you've got your um, auto hold, you've got your e-pedal because you can drive this car just like the uh, Nissan Leaf in uh, full uh, single pedal mode. You can select between the different drive modes. There's eco, normal and sport there. And there's also buttons to open that secret cabinet. We found the buttons. So you can put some secret documents in there if you're a spy or something. I'll close that again. Oh, I might just keep doing that over and over again. It's so much fun. Well, I think I'll stop now. You have these separate controls for the air conditioning. Again, nice to see, and you can see it's dual zoned as well. Um, not physical buttons, but you know they're big uh, touch buttons. They're easy to see because they're well lit. So should be no trouble uh, finding your way around that when you're driving if you need to kind of turn the air con up because it's getting a bit hot. What you'll notice is that if I do this, it turns into a video screen because this actually uses its camera potentially for the rear view mirror. Now, this, we like this version of it. When we looked at the Honda E, 
I found as somebody who uses reading glasses are actually harder to see this than a regular mirror, but you obviously can use it as a regular mirror if you want. And it's not a bad rear view mirror. I could really do my makeup well in this. This car also has a rather nice panoramic sunroof with this. You can see that goes all the way back with this blind. You press this button to open the other section the glass section doesn't that's about as far as it goes there but feel the full air of Sweden very refreshing so just a brief bit about this uh, central 12.3 inch panel when we get a chance to spend more time with this car we'll go through this in more detail you can see it's got a full full width sat nav in this mode you can go into the home screen where you get some different options um, you'll notice that the sat nav is on the right here um, you can actually connect CarPlay and Android Auto as well, so that you could you could have your phone connected. So you could actually also have the, um, uh, the your phone's sat nav on here instead. Um, music controls. Let's turn that off again. That's very nice. We do like a bit of James Brown. I have to admit, phone stuff more. There's greater control over air conditioning. We may have to stop James Brown now turn James Brown down as much as I love James Brown if you press this button here you get to some of the settings so you can Bluetooth settings all settings you see connections navigation system settings not a hugely comprehensive set of settings there but I think the average driver isn't going to want to be playing with too much anyway so this front wheel drive 63 kilowatt hour version has a 0 to 62 miles per hour speed of 7.5 seconds which is decent in this class it's pretty fast actually now if you go for the all-wheel drive eforce version that drops to 5.1 seconds which is fairly competitive not as fast as the tesla model y long range but still probably fast enough for a family suv because that car is 394 ps dynamically this car feels very smooth to drive although it's apparently one of the highest in terms of ride height uh, in its class because it's got all the batteries and weight low down it feels pretty stable going around corners acceleration is brisk but smooth so you can see it I'm just twiddling the steering wheel there and you can feel it does as, as immediately have an effect on the car you know not not exactly sporty but you know, the, um, a nice middle ground between something that gives you some input uh, without uh, making it too firm and, and, and tense a driving experience. So these seats, they do have a fairly high bolster, which keeps you in place around a corner. That's a good thing. We really like that kind of seat. So having this HUD is a real benefit. It means I don't really need to look down at the instrumentation that much when I'm driving. So I popped, on, popped open the sunroof, so there's a bit more light coming in. This cabin felt fairly roomy beforehand, but now it feels really quite spacious. And so now we're driving in eco mode, so I really feel a lot less responsive than the throttle. Go back up to standard, which is what I was driving in before. That, that's a pretty good mode to drive about in. Pop up to sport and very sprightly. Now you also have this um, e-pedal button. If I turn that on, you can feel there's a lot more regen when I take my foot off the pedal. So with e-pedal mode and B mode, you're gonna have that full one pedal experience. If you're a Nissan Leaf driver in the past, or, or some other cars now have proper one pedal driving as well, you're gonna have exactly the same driving experience. Brakes seem to work pretty well. So although Nissan claims this car is one of the more compact vehicles in its class, it's still a big, tall SUV. So it's not gonna be as easy as a hatchback to park. Now that's luckily where things like this uh, camera-based rear view mirror will come in handy to uh, give you a better sense of what's around you. And it's also worth noting that EVs with their smooth delivery of power tend to be a little bit easier to park anyway. So, you know, I talked about the bolsters on these seats and we're now on a motorway and it's a, there's a, I have to adjust it a bit more, but there's a slight hardness to the back of this, which, um, you know, I, I like that supportively, but some people might find that um, doesn't suit longer journeys as much. But overall, this car is gonna be able to do long journeys really well. And that matches very nicely those extremely long ranges for the, uh, 
87 kilowatt hour versions of this car that we talked about earlier. You know, with this lower end version having 250 miles of range, where you know the lower end versions of some other brand cars would have more like 200, you know, you're not gonna have to worry too much about range anxiety with this vehicle. And with over 300 miles WLTP with the other ones, then definitely a really good long range car. So cars these days really have to concentrate on all the safety kit and this car is, is packed with technology you have things like lane keep assistance there's blind spot detection intelligent braking nissan has done a really good job in terms of, of uh, all-round visibility i've got a very good view from the wing mirrors you know obviously i've got the um uh, the rear view mirror i've noticed actually that i can uh, i can see both the camera version and um the uh, the reflected version just by kind of slightly changing my uh my eye focus, which is a slightly odd experience. So I just felt the uh, the lane keep assistance kick in. Not the most intrusive. I actually think it's one of the one of the better systems that I've I've come across. A little vibration. It doesn't yank the steering wheel. Um, it makes itself known because you know some of some systems like you know the Stellantis ones they give you a, a noticeable jerk on the steering wheel, which actually can distract you from driving rather than um, making you be aware of the uh, the safety situation so one of the reasons why you buy a crossover car is to have that kind of high and road presence of an SUV with without kind of actually having to have a full 4x4 and um, although obviously the e-force is a four-wheel drive vehicle and this car definitely has that road presence and that you know that's really nice on highway drive and you've got a good view of the road road ahead and behind you as well there is a really nice premium feel to this car but it doesn't have that kind of ostentatiousness uh, and and showiness of some of the german brands so we're in a dark tunnel right now about to join a traffic jam and you know you can see that all the buttons are very very clear and easy to to see so this is a quality car and it comes up a fairly high price so the the pricing comes at just under forty four thousand pounds for the entry level version and it goes up to just over fifty six thousand pounds for the the top of the range trim with the e-force drivetrain that's quite expensive it does put it in the same ballpark the top one at least with the, the model y performance and um you know in terms of outright speed it's uh it, it's not quite up there but you know, in terms of kind of driving quality, some people will prefer the slightly more traditional look, the Nissan brand. It also, it's also been given a very high residual value of uh, 57%. That will give it op the option of cheaper lease deals because the, um, the, the, the value at the end of the lease will be higher, so they won't need to charge you quite so much during the uh, monthly payments. So not a bargain basement car, but this feels like a step up in quality for Nissan. It's really nice to drive. There's a sense of luxury inside and the price is pretty much on par with, with other cars um, of this level of quality. And it ticks all the boxes in terms of features as well. Highly recommended. Thanks for watching and if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel.